He stole hundreds of millions of dollars, falsified thousands of documents, led 20 federal agencies on a wild goose chase, and got away with it for far too long. A number of innocent companies found themselves in serious financial hurt, all due to the shady action of Habib Chaudhry. Banks and the FBI teamed up, creating the biggest ever anti-fraud coalition. And still, finding their man wasn't easy. How did it all play out? What happened to the money? And how can we avoid something like this happening to us? Stay tuned to find out. Once Habib Chaudhry had wound up his cunning fraudster scheme, the American financial sector found itself in disarray. Businesses and financial institutions were left feeling the effects of hundreds of millions of dollars of losses, losses which seemed impossible to recover. When we look at the 10 biggest countries around the world in terms of GDP, which is the entire country's monetary value of its goods and services, the United States of America's credit card debt is almost $1,200 more than its nearest rival. That's per person. America is a nation reliant on credit. As technology advances and contactless payments become the norm, that reliance only grows. For every positive that the credit card provides, you know, like ease of use, ability to splurge online, and the idea of buying now and paying later, there are also significant risks. As more Americans opt for credit cards, it simply opens up more avenues for criminals to steal. These days, banks are advertising more Visa and MasterCard promotions, encouraging higher spending limits, and lessening the strictness of applicants requirements, meaning that criminals, fake IDs in hand, can benefit financially in degrees far greater than ever before. And that's exactly what this man did. From 2014 to 2017, the Justice Department filed nearly 10,000 financial fraud cases against nearly 15,000 defendants, none of which, however, could so much as hold a mirror to our guest of honor, Habib Chaudhry. So let's take a step back. Who is this guy? How on earth did he manage to single-handedly defraud the fortress that is the United States financial system? Well, for starters, it wasn't single-handedly at all. He had a network of fraudsters at his disposal, able and willing to help him steal. But we'll get to that later. Chaudhry hails from Valley Stream, New York. That is right here. It was here that he was able to base his operation, collaborate with his network, and create a long-standing stream of fraudulent identification documents. Those documents were a key pillar in creating one of the most successful credit card fraud schemes in American history. All up, the operation caused more than $200 million in confirmed losses to businesses and financial institutions across the country. And who knows how many more millions that weren't officially accounted for. To steal that much cash, well actually it wasn't cash, it was credit, that's the whole point. To steal that much credit would have required an elaborate portfolio of fake documents and real addresses. But like we said, Chaudhry wasn't the only one involved. He worked in tandem with the likes of Tahir Lodhi, Babar Qureshi, Ijaz Butt, and plenty of others. 22 people in total, 19 of which pleaded guilty before Chaudhry was found. They got away with it for much longer than anyone could have expected. But how? What kind of plan could have been so foolproof to have sent the FBI into disarray? We'll tell you. The scheme involved a three-step process. Step one, Chaudhry and his colleagues would fabricate a false identity. Unless there was a case of coincidence, they weren't stealing a real persona, they were creating new people altogether. To build formal pieces of identification, like passports, driver's licenses, birth certificates, bank accounts, and educational achievements like bachelor's and master's degrees, the thieves put in endless hours of work. You would assume that acquiring and creating these documents would be exceptionally expensive, although that's not quite true. Quite the contrary, in fact. A research team from safety detectives visited several marketplaces on the dark web and compiled the average cost of the necessary documents one would need to start a brand new life with a shiny new identity. Go ahead, take a guess. A million dollars? 100,000? Nope. For an American identity, just a lowly $1,152. A mere sliver of the profit that these thieves would eventually make in the long run. That was step one, create false personas. Then came step two using the personas to formulate a credit profile with the major credit bureaus. If, say, they'd made up a new person by the name of John Smith, then one of the fraudsters, acting as John Smith, would provide all the necessary information to a credit bureau in order to establish a strong, trustworthy credit score. Finally, step three. They would use these credit profiles, which showed positive, albeit bogus, information, to open up bank accounts and sign up for credit cards or take out loans. Either way, they'd borrow or spend as much as they humanly could before the bank caught wind that there was 0% chance that the debt was ever going to be repaid. 
In most situations, if you overspend on your credit card or don't pay back your loan, then the bank comes a knockin'. But since the fraudsters were spending money on behalf of people who didn't exist, there was no way for the fake John Smith to be chased down. By the time one account had been closed for overspending and lack of repayments, several others were being opened and exploited. There was one crucial piece of information that couldn't be faked – addresses. But remember, we were dealing with forward thinking, not run-of-the-mill snatch-and-grab style thieves. Chaudhry and his co-conspirators maintained more than 1,800 houses, apartments, and post office boxes across the country, which they referred to as their drop addresses. Each of these mailing addresses corresponded with a false identity and would receive documents and credit cards sent out by the institutions. With this detailed plan in effect, Chaudhry's team successfully fabricated over 7,000 fake identities, which allowed access to tens of thousands of credit cards. With 19 people pleading guilty and adding Chaudhry to that list, plus two more yet to be caught, the 200 million would have turned into roughly 9.09 .09 million bucks in each person's pocket. Assuming an even split, not bad for what was probably just a few years of shady work. While it's not clear how each one of the scammers spent their money, we can infer that whatever was left of it was forced to be repaid upon arrest. The man at the center of it all would have had more chance to spend than any of the others because after the rest of the gang was convicted in 2013, Habib Chaudhry remained a fugitive for the better part of four years. Despite being charged for his role in the scam, Chaudhry was nowhere to be found. The FBI hasn't revealed the intricate details of how they caught the scammers. What we do know, however, is that postal inspectors with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service played a helpful role. Perhaps one of the thousands of fake documents caught the eye of a keen investigator. Or perhaps the thieves were met with undercover agents at one of their drop locations. Either way, their actions proved a need for the American government to create one of the biggest task forces in the nation's financial crime history. Obama's Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force was made up of more than 20 federal agencies, 94 U.S. attorney's offices, as well as state and local partners. Together, they were able to uncover most of the answers. Although there was one question that kept the elite task force scratching their heads. Where on earth was Habib Chaudhry hiding? They might never have achieved a clear-cut answer, but they don't need one, because Chaudhry gave himself up in January 2017, after nearly four years on the run. It's a good thing that he did, too, because the FBI would have likely been spending far more than they had anticipated. In 2020, of their entire $9.31 billion FBI budget, only $18.2 million is laid out to target and disrupt organized financial crime networks. What about the punishment? The conspiracy to commit bank fraud charge carries a maximum potential penalty of 30 years in prison and a $1 million fine, so a hefty chunk of the group's profits would have gone to covering their fines, plus legal fees. As for the rest, well, your guess is as good as ours. It could still be sitting in an offshore account to this very day. While the perps have been caught, the majority of the money that was stolen will never be paid back, leaving the unfortunate financial institutions to bear the brunt of the cost. It begs the question, how can they possibly recover from such a big hit? We envision a few solutions. One, government assistance, while rare, could help recoup the losses. Two, the thieves could pay back their stolen money. But let's be honest, the chances of that happening are slim to none. The most likely solution, and the one that indirectly affects the rest of the population, is a deliberate change in interest rates. In order to rebalance their books, banks would need for the average customer to pay a little bit more interest on their credit cards or loans. When we focus on Chaudhry's scheme, the interest rate adjustments needed would be minuscule. $200 million in the grand scheme of things, spread across a number of institutions, isn't overwhelming. But when we factor in the long list of all ID fraudsters around the country who stole $16 billion in 2014 alone, then the need to recoup losses and the extent needed to do so grows significantly. Fraud takes many dimensions, not just creating new fake identities, but stealing the identities of reliable, innocent, everyday people just like you. Whether we like it or not, we're all at serious risk. As technology has advanced, so has the fraudster's toolkit. Hackers who target businesses and steal customers' credit card information have risen tenfold in recent years. And since many of us regularly opt for cards instead of cash, we don't often notice a few stray transactions on an account statement full of online spending. So what exactly can we do about it? How can we stop criminals like these from stealing our money and our identity?
for starters, you could refrain from digital transactions altogether and revert back to cash as your main form of payment. But what about online purchasing, you ask? Easy fix. Prepaid visas and gift cards. If that's a little too drastic of a change, you can still set limits on your credit account and simultaneously ensure to regularly check your balances. Furthermore, change your passwords once in a while, just to be sure that nothing shady is afoot. If you're withdrawing from an ATM, keep an eye out for pieces of equipment that seem like they just don't belong. Thieves have been known to install auxiliary card readers on ATMs, which steal your information as soon as you insert your piece of plastic. Have you ever been a victim of a credit card fraud or an identity theft? Have you ever had something stolen from you? And if so, what did you do about it? Let us know what happened in the comments. We would love to hear your story. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and as always, thank you so much for checking out The Richest. See you next time and have a great day.